Well, morning everyone. I hope you're all really, really well and you join me in the wildflower meadow. And you may remember in my recent uh, barn owl videos, I mentioned that one of the biggest satisfactions for me as a conservation photographer was that the owl was hunting over land that I've been working on really hard for more than 10 years, trying to bring it back um, from arable land that had been heavily cultivated and sprayed for, for many, many years before that. Um, so this is briefly about my project. I just thought it might interest some people about the work that's involved, what I've been trying to achieve here for all the wildlife, not just the barn owls. Uh, and the changes from just a few years ago are really amazing. Um, and I'm going to show you around um, and what I've been doing, but also suggest how maybe if you want to, you can start a project of your own um, from something really, really small um, with like a small wildflower matter right up to something maybe like this. Right, a little bit about this project. This was um, originally just normal farmland and it was attached to the adjoining farm and it was sown and sprayed for many years with uh, some pretty aggressive chemicals, um, quite a few of which are banned now I suspect. And um, we're going to go over to the edge of the boundaries and I'll show you why uh, the neighbouring fields are totally devoid of wildlife and why farming practices make such a massive impact on, on wildlife and wildlife conservation. So we're going to go over the edges now and have a look. Right, so this is one of the fields, um, and to be honest, it's a monoculture. It's the fields we often see walking around the countryside, but as you can see, although you've got this fence line, there'll be a little bit of wildlife like mice that run along the very edge into my field. Um, but the one over there is, apart from a few uh, buttercups, there's nothing. It's been sprayed to death, no wildlife, and of course that will be cut in just a few weeks' time. And again, anything that was trying to nest in there, like skylarks, will be destroyed anyway as well. So. Um, it's not too bad because of the very edge of the margin, but it's, it's still pretty rubbish for wildlife. But we're going to go and see something that's even worse. Now, from a barn owl's point of view, this is the absolute pits. It's the worst possible kind of environment. You can see, for our, sadly, for our woolly friends over here, who are having quite a good time, um, you can see they've grazed this field down to absolutely nothing. So there's no, no grass or um, anything environment for the uh, insects or plants, let alone voles or mice to live in. But more importantly, right up to the edge of the fence, the sheep have grazed it down to nothing. Um, so even the wildlife corridor that would have been here, I can imagine if this field had sheep in as well, there'd be absolutely nothing. So from a, from a wildlife point of view, it's a complete desert. Right, to briefly explain, the whole project is split into four sections. This is the rough grassland section, which is fantastic for the barn owls and the kestrels. This is the wildflower meadow, which is just starting to burst into life. Behind, we've got the regenerating section, which I'll explain later. And the other side, over by the fence where the sheep were, that's the, um, that's the sprayed area from last year, which is a bit devoid of life at the moment, and I'll explain that as well. But I think to get a better idea, I'll tell you what, I'll go and get a ladder, and we'll go up and have a look and get a much better view, okay? So I'll, just get, I'll go and get the ladder now, okay? So here we are on the top of the ladder, um, the world's highest ladder, and it's really interesting to see the different tones within the field. And you can see, first of all, the area on the left, um, the browner area is the long grass of the rough grassland, which is where the kestrels and the barn owls hunt. Uh, and that's been like that for seven or eight years now, at least. Um, at the top, you see the wildflower meadow, which is the dark green area as all the new flowers come through for this spring. And then just below it, where the telegraph pole is, is the regenerating meadow. And that's a fascinating area because that had to be sprayed a little bit two years ago, but the wildflowers are now spilling over from the wildflower meadow down into the regenerating meadow remarkably quickly, and it's great to see. And the other area you can see below that is the sprayed area, which sadly last year, because we had so many um, thistles and docks and ragwort, the only sensible way to get rid of them was actually to spray it. And of course, that's killed everything else 
but hopefully it will return like the regenerating area and the idea is hopefully it will slowly spill over. But you can also see the sheep field on the right and it shows you just how under undiversified that is compared with the meadow and the rough grassland on the left. So this is the rough grassland section, um, which is really why I started the whole project to try and encourage my barn owls, as that's always been my thing, if you like. Um, but it's easily the best habitat um, for a reliable food source for them. Um, of course, this applies to things like kestrels just as much as barn owls. Um, barn owls need two things if they're going to survive and bring up chicks, particularly in the spring. So one, they need a, a, a nesting or a roosting site. But of course, it also has to be in an area where they can get enough food. And that's not just for them, but it's also, of course, for the chicks. Now, there's been some amazing research over the years. Um, and it's estimated that a barn owl's, pair of barn owls need something between 20 and 45 hectares. So that's like 50 to 110 acres of suitable uh, land uh, within one to one and a half kilometers of their nest. Now, that's totally dependent on the quality of the land. So as we were just saying, arable landscapes over there are twice as good as really bad grazed landscapes that we saw over there. Um, and uh, in grazed landscapes, so you need at least twice, if not three times the area. And they did some research in 2012, which actually showed that the average range of a barn owl in mixed farmlands, so we've got a bit of everything, maybe not much of this ideal habitat, but you've got some arable, some grazed, they reckon it's at least 1,100 acres. So that's a vast area on a normal farm. So you can imagine the effort on the barn owl is really quite intensive to get enough food within the range of the nest site to have their chicks. Now field margins, you know, your margins around the edge of each field, are often mentioned as suitable. But if you assume that they are five metres wide, um, and then you want 20 hectares, which is the minimum of ideal grass roughland. So let's assume you can make your, your margin the perfect roughland like this, and it's five metres wide. To get to the ideal amount of food resource, you'd have to have 40 kilometres of those margins. So it gives you an idea of just how, how tricky it is to get the balance right on a farm uh, or in land, and why areas like this are just so incredibly valuable for barn owls. <laughs> I just got the shock of my life because I just disturbed a short tail vole. I sat down here and one scurried out of there. It made me jump. Anyway, um, rough grassland. Why is it so incredibly good? The reason is this stuff. Now, it's only grass, but what happens, the grass grows in the summer. This green stuff comes up and then in the autumn, the winter, it dies back and falls over. This is all this, this stuff from last year. And what it does falls over and the new green grass, exactly as you can see here, the green grass comes up through and creates this mesh and a network. And so you get this, what they call um, litter layer, which is basically all the grass that's folded over. And this creates these perfect environment for, as you can see, this goes down a good 10, 12 centimetres here. And that's why one was down here. Um, it's perfect habitat for short tailed voles, shrews, uh, wood mice, things like that. And when you have those uh, prey items, they've done research again with barn owls, and they reckon that um, when they've got the ideal diet, 82% of their diet will be short tailed voles, wood mice, and shrews. And this field is full of them. And a study in 1992 also showed that um, they're catching up to about 16 prey items a day um, when they're hunting for their chicks. So that's incredible. Also when they're feeding, the male is feeding the female. That's another time when they're feeding really, the barn owls hunting really actively, which is often why in March or April, early April, you see them, the barn owls are hunting a little bit more. Um, but so it's incredibly, incredibly important. Um, and also bear in mind that when this is perfect, this area can accommodate, when you get this perfect rough grass, and they estimate you can accommodate 400 voles per hectare. And a hectare is 100 metres by 100 metres. So in that 100 metres square, you can get up to 400 voles. So you can imagine how, when you get an area like this, how vital it is for a barn owl that's trying to catch 15, 16, 17 items of prey a night. What I want to remember is that the... The, ben the side benefits of doing something like rough grassland is you create things like this. This is an anthill and the green woodpeckers um, come and eat the ants out of these regularly. And again, it's another benefit of having this undisturbed, unsprayed, no chemicals environment that uh, benefits absolutely everything. One thing I would say if you're thinking of doing this is, man, it, it, it does involve a little bit of cost, obviously, um, especially if you're gonna sell a wildflower meadow, which I'll show you later, um, because you have to buy the seed. But one other thing is mainly maintenance, and in rough grassland in particular, um, if you just leave it, it goes back to scrubland. And this is a, 
uh, you can see this, this is only from last year. So this is grown, this is its second year. And this stuff has to be removed. Otherwise, eventually this field will just go back to woodland. It'll be taken over, which is how nature regenerates anyway, which is amazing, but not great if you're trying to maintain open rough grassland. Um, and this actually is dogwood. And uh, I'm now gonna give you this week's um, interesting wildlife fact of the week. And why is it called dogwood? Um, nothing to do with our furry friends whatsoever. And uh, in the old days, butchers used to take these sticks and they're very straight and when they're dry, they go very, very, very hard. So they use these for skewering meat and chicken and beef so they could cook it better. So in fact, it's all to do with your barbecuing meat and nothing to do with dogs. So that's a little bit of uh, interesting knowledge for you there. And um, I tell you, you don't get that on Tom Heaney's channel, do you? And this area is the wildflower meadow, um, which from a, drama, from a drama point of view um, is unbelievably exciting every year. And if you'd come here about four or five weeks ago, we're now uh, about May the 14th. So if you'd come here um, four or five weeks ago, six weeks ago, this would just been completely flat, just like the rest of the field, very boring, very dull. And literally it just, once it starts, it explodes. And this is something that you can replicate yourself on a much smaller scale. Now this is quite big. This is about 50 meters by 50 meters. Um, and all you have to do really is it has to be cut every year and you leave the grass cut and you let the seeds fall through. So it has to be left as hay for about four, three or four days. And that's exactly what the old hay meadows used to be, which is why they were so good for wildlife. Because what happens is the plant shed, sheds its seed, it drops down into the ground. You then pick up the hay to, to feed your animals over winter, but the seeds stay in the ground. If you, pick, if you cut it or, and pick it up all on the same day, all those seeds get scooped up. So hay flower meadow maintenance is actually a little bit, little bit more interesting than just cutting a normal field of grass. Um, but it is amazing. And this, in fact, is not great for the barn owls because as it gets cut every year, of course, it goes back down. There's no, none of that grass litter layer that I was talking about in the um, grassland over there, the rough grassland. But of course, this is absolutely amazingly good for butterflies and for grasshoppers and insects galore, which benefits the, uh, you get lots of lizards in here and shrews and of course the birds like it. But it's mainly just the splash of colour you get for about six or eight weeks in, in, the, uh, in the middle of uh, June, July period. Um, absolutely amazing. I would say as well is that a wildflower meadow is something that you can do yourself. If you have a garden or an area of land you have access to, it's something you can actually do quite easily. You only need a pot like, you know, three foot by three foot. It hasn't got to be big. If you can get a fire, but there are three things you need to do is you want to have a, an area that's in total sunlight. Um, when you, what you need to do is get rid of all the grass and rather radically, when you do this, you need to kill everything with a weed killer. So get it right down so the ground is totally neutral. Um, otherwise you get grass competing. And I have that problem here and the grass is getting a bit, um, I didn't do enough of that when I first started. So there's a lot of grass in here that chokes out a lot of the wildflowers. But if you can do it in a small area, just a small part of your garden or um, anywhere you have access to, or even a window box, you can do it. And then what you do is you, you say you neutralize that soil. Um, you create a nice little fine tilth on top and sow a seed that suits the land you're on. So if you're on clay or if you're on chalk, you need to go to a supplier of wildflower seed that's a sustainable supplier, make sure they're reliable, and you simply use the seed that suits your soil. So for instance, I can't grow poppies here because they need free draining soil and I'm on heavy clay, but I've got lots of things here that go really well. But you can do that in a small area and you'd be amazed in just a three foot or a six foot square, the, the insect life you get, as well as the amazing colors you get. And every year, different flowers come through as the seeds settle down and some germinate for longer than others. Um, but I really, really recommend it. That's one thing I recommend from this. You can't necessarily do the rough grassland, but if you've got a tiny area of your garden, make it into a wildflower meadow and it's an amazing thing to do for wildlife. These are um, oxide daisies that have, uh, I'll talk about in a second, but um, it can be tough. I fully appreciate that if you, it can be very tough to know what you can actually do to help. And especially if you live in a city or an urban area, um, it's difficult to feel you can really make a difference. Um, but what I would suggest, there are some amazing local wildlife trusts and conservation groups all around the world, not just in the UK. But, and if you find your local one, if you really want to meet like-minded people and volunteering is a fantastic thing and they will teach you so much about a, the area you're in. So I really recommend if you, if you can't do something yourself practically, um, and yeah, ideally do both, but um, I really recommend joining local wildlife trusts and conservation groups. They are amazing groups of volunteers and it just be a really good fun as well. And you learn a lot about wildlife that you didn't know before. 
And finally, folks, I just want to show you one little bit about the power of nature and the power of its own regeneration. If you let it get on with it, it does it really well. Um, if you remember from the map, I show you this is the wildflower meadow, which is always done really, really well, and we look after that, and that does fine. Um, you may remember I mentioned about the fact that last year, because we had a real ingress of things like uh, um, ragwort, which is, became a real problem. So this area we sprayed, and in fact, there's, as you can see, there's virtually nothing wildlife in it at the moment. Um, there will be things on the fence line, but at the moment there's nothing in this field. You can see it goes right up to there, and it's pretty, pretty, it's a bit of a desert to be honest. However, we sprayed a bigger bit of the field uh, two years ago. And so last year though, I decided to leave a little bit um, on its own, didn't touch it. Now you look at that, this bit here, this is why this fence, this wire is, this is to mark off the area that, that we had sprayed before. And then if you can see it, but this year already, all of these wildflowers, all of these oxide daisies, everything else has all seeded right up that telegraph pole and across the area we didn't spray. So in the space of a year, you can see how the wildflowers have come from behind you here and have just spread on the wind and have progressively spread over this whole area. Um, and the idea is obviously to get over the whole, take the whole field back over the next couple of years. So if you give nat nature a chance, it will do incredibly well for you. Um, but it also shows just how toxic some of the chemicals used are. But if you want to try something, really go for it. It's really invigorating. Um, it motivates me to get out and do some more stuff. And things like macro photography become really, really good when you get to a wildflower meadow as well. So thanks ever so much for watching. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, just a little venture into my wildflower meadow and rough grass and project for the barn owls and everything else. Um, and uh, I'm glad you can enjoy it. But if you did enjoy it, please subscribe and leave your comments and any questions you've got about doing this or projects you might want to get started with, just drop me a line. I'll try and answer every question if I possibly can. So thanks for watching. See you again soon and enjoy your photography and enjoy the countryside. See you, see you soon. Bright lights and colors Love is for the